just a quick introduction to who I am and what I do. Uh, I think you already mentioned that. Um, I work at City, uh, heading up the UPSEX teams under uh, John Meadows. Uh, he's head of the whole cyber security for, for the bank. Um, so it's a bit, a bit of work that we have, we're doing there. I just want to go through a little bit of uh, the, this is the agenda I'm going to take you through quickly. A um, bit of the supply chain landscape, uh, what Luke uh, mentioned earlier on. Um, a little bit of the background of the why, of why I've come to the conclusion of what I'm doing um, and the history of it. Uh, a solution to what we're seeing in the problem in ingestions and a bit of a wrap up, okay? But what I wanted to really cover was, this is what we're seeing within City as um, the area of supply chain and problems we're seeing at this present moment in time. Luke mentioned already the upscaling of like 750% in supply chain issues. Um, and there's some big reasons for that is because we're seeing a lot more tightening up of infrastructure and attack routes into the bank and other enterprises. So it's a lot easier to go through a supply chain attack than trying to knock down the front door. Um, so with that in mind, we've obviously started looking at uh, a little bit about supply chain, uh, which I'm gonna to touch a little bit on, but mostly about what this major talk is about, is about secure ingestion. Okay, um, a bit quick show of hands. How many of you use something like an artifactory manager to bring your packages in? Do any of you use it at all? A couple, okay. How many of you bring in stuff straight into your pipelines from the web? Some people are very unabashed by that. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting tell. There's a, quite a lot of people do that, okay, and it's quite scary, okay. Um, so before I go into a bit more detail of this, so City, we, John is one on the CNCF or Supply Chain Working Group, and also the board member for the Open Source, Open SSF. Um, sorry, so I'm just going to rearrange this a little bit because I can't actually see all my notes, which is a bit problematic. Okay. Um, and as mentioned, supply chain attacks are on, massively on the, on the increase. We thought it was about 650% this year. Actually, synopsis think it's a bit more like 750%. Um, we see this a lot. Okay, we manage 3 million packages within the city, external packages. It's horrendous. Okay, so this is the area we're going to focus on. Okay. Now, why is this a problem? Well, and thank for Abney for letting me show this tweet. You've got problems all the way along through the life cycle. But if you look at just this, this one example of a possible route into the bank or any enterprise, is any of the package managers, they have pre and post install scripts that can be triggered by the package managers. So as soon as a developer requests that library, that will get triggered within a package manager on that developer's application, on their workspace. As soon as that happens, we're in trouble. It executes the code immediately. So it's not even running in the pipeline, it's just as soon as they request that package in a Maven build, Gradle build, NPM, anything. Now you can turn some of these off, but this is just one aspect of it. And if you look at the, the problems with this, if we look at N, uh, Node, and Node is no exception to this, 2.2% uh, of all packages on Nodes have pre and post install scripts running in their packages. Now, of that 2.2%, we know that 94% of those are malicious. So that's 2% of all packages on Node are malicious, just by that figure. So. As a group, do we think we should allow a package in that has a pre and post install script on it? And how do you check that? Okay, there's nothing really there in the world to check that at the moment. We, we don't have anything to do this. We have scorecards, we have other things which I'll touch on in a second, okay? So that's one part of it. 
Okay, so from my background, you know, the, the um, can we have a secure supply train if we do not understand the maturity of our libraries? It's not possible. We can do all the lovely things about signing, as Luke mentioned, that's the build process and making sure what you're building is correct and all these things. But as a malicious developer, I can still create my packaging node, sign it, stick it in Rector, bring it in, and all of a sudden, bang. Okay. Now, so that's for me, it's not about just has it got a vulnerability. Does it have um, these pre and post install scripts or all other, other aspects in it? Is should you be looking at your libraries and saying, should, is this library mature enough for me? Is it secure enough for me? And what other tests can I run? Okay. Um, and the other problem you've got with this is more and more packages are out there trying to write something to scale to the, de the demands that your developers need is tricky. You know, like I said, City, we're having three million packages every single time we have to look at them. And the, the, the risks on those packages are evolving all the time. So we have to do that in a, almost a continuous process. Okay. So, um, there's a lot of, in, um, I would say, in, um, Intel feeds we have into the system. Um, a very good one is from Google called, they've donated to the uh, OpenSSF, and that's your scorecards. That's excellent, gives you some really good insights into the re repo on what you're doing. Um, it will tell you such thing as, has it got static code analysis on it, branch protection, token permissions, and all these things. But that's just part of the, the story, you know. How you go from accepting a piece of code coming in, like something maybe from Google Assured Open Source software, uh, which is a service, they do a lot of checks and fuzzing and checking of the software, and they sign it, and you're gonna, there's free editions, and there's also enterprise and organizational editions. Um, the Alpha Omega project, I, please check the, the, those projects out. They do a lot of fuzzing and an upstream, pushing the fixes to the uh, open stream vendors. You know, we take those and we say, yep, we're happy with those. They've done all the checks that we want. We trust that reputation. Then you got on the far right hand side, you got all the reds, you know. This, is it coming from a sanctioned country? Okay. In some cases, it's not a problem for a lot of people, but for a US bank, it is a little bit of an issue. Okay. Is a signature failing? If a signature fails, that's, a, for me, I said, we have to stop immediately. There's something malicious going on there. So we stop immediately. We do say, no, and that's it. Malicious code detection, I mentioned and touched on that already about the um, install scripts. Okay, but it's the gray area, it's the problem. How do you get a decision and moving it from the, the gray into the green? How do you say to a developer, oh no, you can't use this last bit of software because it's not got any SAS or fuzz, it's not fuzz or it's got branch protection. If you have a, a, a straight no, you're going to stop productivity and you're going to get a lot of people shouting at you within your development teams. Okay. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to move to automate a lot of these things that all these checks here, what is the, if, if it fails that check, what do we do to get a good smell about it? How do we make sure that we can actually start using this library? And I'll give you an example of this. React, one of the most common frameworks used. It's signed. One of its dependencies is not. So if I have a policy in the bank saying no uh, unsigned libraries, we couldn't use React. So that's not possible. So we do compensatory tra checks on the dependencies to make sure that we can bring them in and say, yep, okay, we've gone through these checks. It's failed the signature, he's got no signature. That's fine. We've done other things to make sure we're assuring that's mature enough for us, okay. Um, so that's the, the why as such, um, but a little bit of the history on this, um, I'm quite old and gray and I've done this a couple of times, mostly at, um, uh, military or government organizations, uh, especially, uh, department of defense. Okay. Um, and all we had, we didn't have any of this automation at all. 
We had no way of getting scorecards or any information. All we had was a spreadsheet like this. Okay, we had to go through this every time, justify every single piece of code. Is the age of the repo less than three months? You have to do a full code review of every single library. It was painful. So this spreadsheet was um, done by a colleague of mine called Francois Eric Goyamash from HRD. And when we brought this in, if it passed these, this test, we had to provide this information. And then we had to build everything from source, including the Oracle database. So we had to give the Department of Defense escrow code from Oracle and our code, everything sourced, all wrapped up with a start off script make at the start. And it would make everything. That is incredibly painful. And there was a guy at HR working for the company called uh, Jean Christophe Demeclair. He created a product called AC Builder. If they sold it today, it would make a fortune. Okay. But the lesson we learned from there is trying to build everything from source, you, nobody has got enough, well, Google and their board, if they've got enough scale, they can do that. So not many other people can do that, okay? So that's the, what we, are, we used to have. Thank God we've moved away from these days, okay? Because it was painful. And Luke touched on it, and a few other people have touched on this or before. We now have the Open SS scorecards to tell you, look at the GitHub repository, it will tell you exactly what the branch protection is, it's got uh, two-factor authentication on it, all these, all these lovely things. But that's a huge amount of information, and it's just a case of how do you automate that. You've got SBOMs, you've got Salsa, you've got VEX. So SBOM and Salsa you might have heard of. VEX is vulnerability exchange information. It's like an automated uh, security advisory, but it'll tell you also if a piece of software is not vulnerable, it's not affected. So you can get your vendors to supply you with an SBOM, they can also supply you with VEX information. And that's becoming um, uh, one of the mandates in America at the moment from the US government, that you're gonna start seeing this being pushed into most product vendors who want to supply to the US government and who will want to supply to banks and other institutions of a certain size in America, we're gonna to have to start producing SBOMs and VEX. Okay, and there's not much tooling out there at the moment around this, okay? Kev is another one. Um, I always love mentioning Kev because it just sounds great. Um, Kev is known exploitable vulnerability. Okay. Not many people hear about it. We take that and say, okay, this library has a Kev, a known exploit. That's going to knock it up the ranking where we'll say, mm -mm, you have to do something with this. You have to kill it off. Okay. So those are the more of the things we're known to start in the sea we can actually use. Um, and it now allows us to automate and scale this, okay? Question art, do the tools exist? <clears throat> there are a couple. There's a couple of proprietary tools that do exist at the moment. They have limited security fees, proprietary security fees. Um, and so I would say limited scorecards. But we want to aggregate over several uh, vulnerability suppliers uh, of Intel. Um, a perfect example of this was we know of an individual who uh, forked Ghidra and was used in some malware in a bank. That individual had a, a linked identity to a, another identity that was patching and providing code views and code submissions into Guava. Okay, so Obviously, we could see spot when this person did code submissions that weren't reviewed and it got pushed. We went, no, thank you. We'll not take that version yet. Well, we'll do some testing of it first. So this, that level of intelligence is coming in. It's not just vulnerabilities. It's not just the maturity. There's also other Intel feeds. So you need to be able to aggregate this across those, those Intel feeds, okay? Um, but all of this, the, the further investigation, it takes time. It's a lot of effort. So I'm trying to get something to uh, evolve and do this automatically. Okay. I'm sorry, just check my notes. Anything else I want to say? No. Uh, um, as I said, there are some tools out there. They're most worried about licenses. Why? Okay, most is subjective on the context of use. 
whether I'm using a GPL or not, who cares? Well, it depends on the context. If I'm using GPL JavaScript client side, and I got it in a browser, that's distribution, so you then subject to it. If I'm using an Linux server, fine, no problem. Okay, that's the least of our problems. Okay, is licensing. So, we, uh, we're quite uh, a big supporter of open source, uh, actively supporting and pushing out open source libraries uh, and solutions for City. I think that's been a sea change in the bank in the last two or three years. Um, uh, we've got about three or four major projects that we're supporting. Um, we're doing work on Fresca, which is our secure supply chain software factory, um, which is wrapped around Tecton, Spiffy Spire, so as Luke mentioned about generating a private key, pick key pair, and using that to sign the builds all the way through. That's been donated. We're doing a, lo a lot of work with OWASP dependency track to scale that out. Um, it's currently so somewhat limited to about 6,000 projects. Okay, for simply scale, we decided we're gonna take that on and push that out. So we're gonna Kafkaize it and a few other, a few other things. But the next thing is, this, this is what we call continuous secure software ingestion, okay? We wanna try and automate the ingestion and grooming of the libraries. So when we get feeds in later, we can go through the process again and see what the changes are, okay? Um, we know not everybody is gonna have fixed and hard-coded hard policies, so we need a nice, flexible way for people to set their acceptable risk for that organization, okay? Let me at all, I've said that before. Sign the evidence, work on the best practices we've done for Fresca, the open source, uh, uh, open SSF um, secure software factory, um, but also a way of reevaluating policy if the intel changes or a testing changes, policy changes, and I'll go on to the separation, the difference between the two in a second. Okay. So that's the considerations. Um, I think I've touched on most of those already, actually. I'll just quickly. Uh, um, a couple of problems we've come across is, should we be looking at ingesting the top level package and all the dependencies? Can't do that. Um, so when we're bringing React, we were originally going th all the way through the dependency tree and fetching everything and then processing and reverse it back up. But with all the transitive dependencies that could be overridden at the top level package, it made no sense at all. So you can never work out at ingestion what you actually, they're gonna be the sub-dependencies or the transitive dependencies are gonna be. So you always make sure you do that at build. Okay, for the S-bomb. So we'd only bring in that top level library and not look at the dependencies until that's actually gone through the ingestion process separately on its own, okay? Um, package managers are pretty unique, how they actually do the transversal. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at Maven or NPM and Python and the Go, and it's hell. It's not easy. Um, so we leave that to the package managers. They'll keep themselves up to date, okay? Um, I'll t um, I've touched on this already, the alternative suppliers of um, security check libraries. Please, everybody go look at the Alpha Omega project. That's very, uh, that's super uh, useful to go and get your libraries from. Google shared open source, excellent as well. Okay, they do huge amounts of checks on the libraries and then they're pushing that out. A lot of the libraries are free for use as well. I think it's the first thousand libraries is free for use. So it's, it's very worth looking at, okay? Um, and our design principles, I was gonna say, we use PURL as, I don't know if anybody's come across this terminology. Does, who's cured of PURL or package URL? Okay, it's a way of uniquely identifying a library or a container or an RPM or whatever from any source at all. And it's pretty standardized and used within SBOMs within the industry, okay? And I also mentioned uh, separation of the policy of PURL. I'll touch on that in a second and as we go through what the use cases look like. So where is this all leading? Well, we're building a piece of software with one of our partners, Control Plane, um, to, and the heart of it is the blue piece, where a developer will come in, request for their normal tooling through the normal package manager, will ingest, ingest the PORL, it will go through all the checks, and I'll go into details of that in a second. If that's correct, it gets 
sent to the binary image store and there's a notification out, excellent, all good, and then straight into the evidence store. We make sure that any evidence we collect is not a result. So we're not collecting, it's, it, this is the result of a policy check. This is the intel we've collected and we've signed and put in a policy store. We then do a subsequent check against policy because we know the policy may change, but the intel is unlikely to change, okay? okay. Um, if I change my scanning policies, for example, I'm bringing a library in and uh, I have sneak to check for criticals and highs. If I change that policy to say, now I only accept anything, I accept only cr uh, anything with criticals, that might have a massive impact on what libraries have been allowed in or not. So if you switch that on with 3 million record, uh, 3 million libraries, that might have a huge knock on effect within the bank. So I need to actually check what that effect might be. So when I uh, testing a scan test policy, I'm going to make sure I'm able to tell it, test it against the previous runs. So I can get back an effect of this is what changed. This library wasn't allowed, but now is allowed. Okay, or the other way around, if I tighten up my security policy to say, I now don't allow criticals, highs, and mediums, what does that do? Okay, or I don't allow scripts with, um, uh, packages with scripts, pre and post install scripts, or the signature change. What is the effect? And only after you see or review that, then you can commit that and re ingest again. Okay. Um, the other interesting one is there's a lot of uh, management pieces around there I'm not going to go into. The orange pieces where is we can start getting ahead of the developers where we can register uh, a repo so we can monitor that the repo is when it pushes out a new version we'll automatically go in, right that's a new version we'll go and fetch it go through the checks and it's ready for the developers so they don't have to wait most of this stuff you have to block it anything with an in pre and post install script tests you can't let it get into developers workspace if that happens that's the game over they've already got inside to the bank so we make sure we block until it's gone through our security checks, okay? Um, bit more detail on the actual PRL request. So we have different flows within the system. The PRL lookup is a specific, can be specific to a library or a repo or a particular set. It might be NPM does this or um, normally it's an override, but normally everything will go through the standard flow, and the standard flow will come in, and it will go to the Intel flow first. We'll go and fetch the different intelligence score counts, aggregate them get together, and we'll also always do the standard signature checks and the SCA checks, just to make sure we know this is a standard thing we're going to do. We're always going to do it. It'll follow around and look at the policy scan and do an evaluation. At that point there, you might say, yeah, everything's good. No problem at all. It passes the Intel flow, it passes the SEA checks and the signature checks, great. And it carries on. It might say, actually, we're not sure about this. Um, it's got a signature failure, and this is what we do with um, the React subdependency. And we'll go through the SAS flow and we'll do static code analysis with SandGrab or a few other things. We'll do malicious code detection. We know there's some uh, standard patterns that we're looking for of what that might be used. Um, and if there's an S-bomb, we'll do that as well. Now, those, I would say, the standard flows. There's another flow where we, at the top level, where we'll deny straight away. We'll say, we are not using Spring Boot, period. That's not allowed in the bank. Okay, that's not the case, but that might be, the, that might be one of the routes. And there's another one where we say, actually, we're getting this for this class of library. We know we're going to get it for Google Assured Open Source or the Alpharenka project. Okay, and it'll go straight to that. It will check and validate the artifacts that we receive from them, the SASA attestations, and it will check the metadata and publish that into the R evidence log, okay? The last two, um, I think these are, um, I said with the sandboxing, we're looking at exploding libraries in the sandbox. We're using a Linux namespace for, uh, namespace for the time where we elongate the time, uh, sorry, shorten the time period to accelerate it to see if it's asleep, any sleepy code. 
was talking along the lines of And that, that's another flow. So this is what we're working on. We're not quite there yet. We're just in the process of getting it into the bank. Um, like I said, we're in early alpha. It is in the bank. We are going to open source it um, because we see it's the way that the, the help in the community using this tooling in front of their developers. Because at the moment, there's not a lot out there that does help the developers make a good choice on what libraries they should be using. Okay. Um, uh, I don't have time for the demo. If you do want to see the demo, please take a look at the link. This is a demo we gave at KubeCon uh, Detroit uh, a month ago. Um, so it is not smoke and mirrors. It isn't just PowerPoint. It is actual product. We are going to release it. I'm quite looking forward to it. I'm quite also scared about releasing it because it'll my baby. Um, and then I want, uh, I would love to have feedback of people on advice on what we do with it within the community. Okay. Um, just like I said before, anything else, thank you for having me. Um, any questions? Or have I scared everybody? <laughs> if anybody does have a question, I'll. So um, that's a very nice project. Um, how do you, though, uh, help protect against developers just checking out or downloading a package on their laptop? Um, so, great question. I'll just repeat it for everybody. Um, how do you just stop developers just fetching off the, the web? Okay. We're in a bank. We tie down everything. I can't run AWS or get even Kubernetes or WSL on my Windows PC, okay, we tie down everything, so they can't access it. How do they get stuff into the... Well, a subsequent phase of this is what we're doing is, we're actually reselling the libraries as we're bringing it in. So anything that goes through our build process has to be signed by us, okay? Same as uh, Luke mentioned about Caverno, Caverno, it'll be only signed by keys that we trust as well. So not just the, it's gone through, it's in Rector, it's been uh, built by these people, uh, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the community, it's also gone through our ingestion. So any library that's not signed by us, not known to us, won't get into our production at all, okay? So there's, there's lots of combinations there of tying down where they can go to. That's quite you know, difficult, but it might, there's not an easy answer to that. Okay. Any other questions? Got time for one more. Ah, okay. There, there is an underscore there. I will. I will update it. Um, please, if you uh, uh, if you go to my Twitter handle, I'll, I'll give you an update on it. Okay. Oh yeah, maybe the underscore. Yeah. Yeah. There's an underscore. Yeah. Try to use the people's thing. Yeah. 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 I think it's a double underscore actually. All right, and we have one more question here. Hi, I'm really interesting. I'm just interested in if or how you're dealing with the um, static analysis part of it. You know, the tools which are doing the static analysis are obviously improving over time. So your S bombs are potentially changing for a fixed binary. Is that part of the flow at the moment, or is that something that you're aware of and building on? Um, so static analysis, we don't really use the S bomb on the ingestion at all because it's actually a little bit worthless to us until the package money comes through. We take the, uh, an individual library in isolation. The SBOM generation that we use is in building our applications because the transitive dependencies change so much. Okay, and that's why we came into a problem with that, that the transitives we bring in for that particular library, we're not building that particular library, we're just saying that library, exactly what that is. But it is a known problem. I, I would like to get the SBOM data. I know the GWAC project from is bringing that information in to build the dependency tree, it's really subjective to the ranges on the transitive, so which it becomes really difficult to pin down it's that particular library and therefore getting the correct information. Anyway, thank you all. <laughs>